My name is Tobias Nyholm. I'm going to talk to you about your translation processes. My, this is the title of my talk is Building Your Translation Process. It's not a very sexy title. I would have made it like translation with machine learning and stuff, and a lot of more you would be more interested in this talk. Nevertheless, there's my Twitter handle, so if you want to attack me for the next 30 or 40 minutes, then you're free to do so. I can't really defend myself. And I want to do this talk because a few years ago I was running my site, happier.com. I was running it on in English and in Swedish. And then I got two new clients in Russia and in Denmark. So I had to figure out how to do translations. So I did, as every good developer is doing, started Googling. I Googled like how to do translation in Symfony application or how to do translation in PHP application or just how to do translations. And I got nothing. I got no case studies, I got no blog post, I got barely any tools, I got nothing. So I wanna, I figured everybody's doing this in secret or nobody's really proud of the process. So I wanna tell you now, like, here's my, here's what I came up with. I tried the many, many different things and here, here what I found. And one of these things is like, just realizing this, that languages is not the same as country, and language is not the same as a currency. It made a lot of things more, more easy. So you can, could have a customer in Sweden having a site on English and paying in Euro. That would be fine. So I want to give you like a lot of these kind of realizations. Fair enough? Um, and if you are the kind of person that know that you know everything about your translation process or are super comfortable with this, this talk may not be for you at all. But if you are just running one or two or three languages, then I think you have at least something to learn from this talk. And this will be perfect for you. Let's, before we begin, like, can we have a show of hands? How many of you have websites in more than two languages? That's most of you. More than four languages. That's not even a third. Okay, great. I think this will be great. Uh, short about me. I work at happier.com. We are platform matching people and companies on soft skills and stuff like that. I do a lot of Symfony stuff. I'm a certified developer and I'm recently a part of the core team. And I'm running the PHP meetups in Stockholm. And I do plenty of open source things. I started my open source career. Or I started that in uh, 2016 or 2015 in the conference and the PSR6 cache specification just had to come around. So we we, me and my friend, we were sitting in the in the Airbnb and drank some beers after a conference, and they're like, "Hey, let's let's try to implement this. Let's try to do something about this PSR six. So we that finally turned out with PHP cache and uh, some bundles. At the same time, I did HTTP plug, which is an abstraction over HTTP clients. And when you're working with HTTP clients, you work with a lot of API clients as well, and that turns into a lot of mail clients. And then I wrote like a specification how you should write the perfect API client. And now I'm running both Gossel and Bus. I'm not sure if you remember a few months ago, Bus updated from 016 to 017, and according to December, you can you're allowed to break backwards compatibility with such upgrade. And plenty of people got real angry with, with me for breaking backwards compatibility. And I'm, 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 not, I'm not sorry, but I'm the one who's responsible for that. Uh, I've I written some PSR7 specification. I've written my own PSR4 HTTP, uh, HTTP clients. I do plenty of other things, some test things, and I think I have some more here. I really like this library. It's called NSA. It totally violates all your class privacy. Accessing private properties or methods are very easy with NSA. Um, However, I also do plenty of translation stuff. Um, when I started building my tools, I, I felt I needed something more, so I just added my translation bundle, and I added Happier Auto Fallback bundle, and then I get the maintainer of the GMS translation bundle, and I did a lot of contributions to Lexis translation bundle. Um, so my point is, I've been working a lot of translations. I've written plenty of issues other people having translations, and I want to be, now I want to be this resource that I couldn't find a few years ago. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to talk about Symfony a lot. Doesn't mean this only this only applies to Symfony, but 
It's applicable to any web application, any PHP application. But how many of you, can I have a show of hands, how many of you know Symfony or you work with Symfony? That's more than half. Excellent. You're going to be specifically happy with this. Anyhow, the Symfony translation component, that's one of my top favorite Symfony components. The very top is the option resolver, naturally. And I like these two components because they have very few conce concepts. They're super simple and have no dependencies. So if you didn't know that, the Symfony translation components basically only have a one class, and that class had can, you can throw a lot of resources to it, like translation files, and then you can throw over loaders, things that read resources, and then you have a trans uh, method. So what you basically do, you say, I want to translate this key, and it uses the loaders to read the resources, and uh, builds a big hash map, or they call it a mes message catalog, and then you just give them the translation for that key. And this is all always obviously cached for all performance and stuff. And, but this is the the concept of the, the, this component. This component also have like extractors. So you can look at source code and f filter out the uh, translation keys you have. And with this, you have a lot of loaders and uh, dumpers. So you can basically read from array, you can read from PO files, uh, XLIF files, YAML files, PHP files, or whatever you like. That's, that's everything you need to know about the translation component. And that's basically it, which makes it a great component. Um, so let's get started. Um, say we will we want to build a um, a little application to just to try things off. Um, I'm using Twig. You may be tempted to write your translations directly in here, which I would say you should never ever ever do. Even though we only have one language on your site, you should never write your translation like this. You should obviously use translation keys and you and just use the Twig filter to find them, and then you just use Jamal or something simple to story translations. You could argue like, hey, if I have an admin part of my application, couldn't I use translations right in the admin? And I would say, sure, but I mean, I still would recommend you use something like this. And since you, since you, most of you are Symfony users, I bet that you thought, hey, let's use, j j let's use JMS translation bundle and we get the fancy looking UI like this. Uh, it's, it looks good. Um, you can even like you can even uh, you can update to edit your translations. You can even click over there to get directly into your IDE to see where translations were. And this is this is okay. This solution is fine. It's not good. It's okay. And actually, this is what most people do. And they 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 will leave it over there. And in fact, we can stop here if we like to as well. No. Okay. Sure. I, th I, th I think I, uh, I think I brought you back up on the same level now. So even if you haven't seen translation before, you, we all know approximately the same. Uh, and the reason I say that this solution is only okay and not good is because it has some flaws. And it would be more evident when you add more users to your project. Because, uh, because you will run into merge conflict eventually with your translation files, you will run into merge conflicts. And that seems weird, but while maintaining um, while maintaining JMS translation model, I got plenty of issues like this. They were complaining that they didn't have want to have the uh, JMS uh, file references, because every time they extracted, they, they got updated and have a merge free conflicts with them. So they, someone wanted to have them removed. Someone was complaining that yeah, I'm using this weird operating system, so it doesn't work for me at all. And some other were complaining that you shouldn't use full paths. I should use like relative paths instead, which all three are very valid complaints. And um, I think that 80% of all of all issues on this bundle were either related to the translation files because of merge conflicts or the extractor because that's way complex code. So I thought about this, and it took me a great while to realize that it's fundamentally wrong to store your translation files in Git. And I, I know this sounds weird at first, but your translation files, they're not code, it's data. And you're not storing any other database in Git, are you? And nobody should really care about the format of your translation file or, I mean, you, nobody should have, have any issues, merge issues with your translation files. So if we, for a second, 
don't store our translation files in Git, all, this pro all these problems will go away. And you might also think like, hey, this is just the bundle that has some flaws. I want to store my translation files in Git anyways. But it will become more evident when you're adding more languages. Say, say you have eight languages on your site. And you all store them in static files. You have them in Git. And you're adding a new feature, so you're adding a 100 new translation keys. These static files need to be updated, so you update them somehow, and then need to be translated, right? So, you, so what, what do you do? You send them to your translator, and then you wait, f wait for a week or two, and then you, ha you handle some merge conflicts when they come back, because you don't stop working when you, you send away the file. You continue to work with the next feature, right? Or you could um, teach your translator how to use Git, I mean, and let them handle the merge conflicts. That, that would be excellent, wouldn't it? Or say that we set up a new host, we install like JMS translation bundle, and let the translator go into that new host somehow and edit translations, and then in our CI process, we merge them back in Git somehow. It actually is more of the latter, but we don't store them in Git, but we store them in, in the cloud. We store them in the translation service. There, there's plenty of them. I, I tend to use Loco. Uh, I know other people are very happy with Transiflex. Transiflex. Uh, but any of them will really do. The important thing is that your, your translations, this, they, they, the true source of your translations should be on, the, on any of these services. Sh this should be in the cloud. And like I said, I use Loco because I really like their API and I think they have a decent GUI. So this is, this is where I send my translators. I mean, I tell them, hey, go in here and you do some translations. And also, I know Loco has this service that you could download them and download all translations and XLIPS files and import them and export them, yada, yada. But the important thing is that's, that's Loco's problem. I mean, I'm just using their, their service. Um, I, I did this talk once before, and I got a comment, once, one guy telling me from the audience, he said that I was a great Loco speaker. I apparently mentioned Loco so much, and I expressed that I really loved it so much, so he thought I was employed there. I'm, I'm really not. I'm just a very happy customer. I think I will be equally happy with some other service as well. But when I say, whenever I say Loco, I really mean a cloud service, translation cloud service. So the true source of my translations are in, in Loco, and at each deployment, I just download whatever's in Loco and use, and use when I deploy. Good? So how about uploads? You can still use your fancy UI if you like. Uh, I'll talk more, more about this in a minute. Um, this question about translation format is something that people really care a lot about. I'm not sure why. Uh, they, they ask on, online, like, what translation, translation format should I use? And the answer is, I don't really care. I don't really care at all. And you shouldn't care either, because your translation source is just a secondary cache. Since you're not in Git anymore, you don't you don't care about what translation they are, and you, you use your web UI to read them, so you don't you don't care at all. Um, it's like caring what what file formats or what file formats your Symfony cache is in. So, if you feel like, hey, I have my my, I, I oh, sorry, I would recommend to store them in Jaml. No, sorry, I would recommend storing them in Xlif because Xlif is the industry standard for translations files. So if you have them in Jaml already, you can use you can use this fancy converter you to convert it from whatever file format you have to Xlif. And I like this converter because it uses the Symfony translation component, and this really shows how beautiful the, the component is because I'm. I mean, I'm basically just doing this. I have a translation reader and a translation writer. So I basically just read from the input and then I write to the output and the output, I read JAML and export XLIF. So I have this fancy looking converter, just a hundred lines of code, basically just doing this. And I think this show how this simple, this simple Symfony components is super flexible. I can do whatever I like with it. Um, this is also basically how it works. There's, there's some lines I've removed. I'll try to do a quick lightning round now with some small tips and tricks, uh, very short topics, starting with some easy ones. Your URLs, how, how should you properly structure your URLs? Um, a URL is a unique resource locator, and 
two different versions of your site, two, uh, t the same page for two different languages of your site, it's two, two different pages. So they should have two different URLs. You should not try to have the same URL for two languages. Uh, Google really cares about how your URLs look. My users really, really don't. So on my public pages, I, I've added the, the locale in the URL. For my private pages, like my account, I don't really care. Um, you could also use a different strategy, say you want to use subdomains. A great benefit of this using subdomains is that you can have different versions of your applications, of your, of your application on different locales, if you liked. Uh, you should also like, hey, how do Google treat subdomains? I mean, how, how does Google care about the, all the linked use or page rank or whatever? How do they handle different subdomains? But that, that's another question. Um, most of my slides says that here's something you could do. This is the only slide that says this is something you should do. You should always, always do this. It's basically adding some uh, metadata in your head section of HTML, saying like, this version of the site is in Swedish, here's the version in, in French, and here's the version in English. And this example might look easy, but if you have something like, if you have localized URLs, you, this looks like this, it doesn't become evident what it is. So that, that's why you should always have, always have this few lines telling what, what the other links to the other languages are. Uh, this is to tell Google and other bots about your website. And also, I don't know if you know this, but I think Symfony 4.1 has, they have an update in core that allows you to do localized URLs like this. So it works out of the box. Before Symfony 4.1, you had to use uh, the international internationalization routing bundle. Uh, say that a new user comes to your site. You have never seen this user before. What language do you serve him or her? I've implemented some I, a local resolver that have like seven different strategies to figure out what language to serve. Um, here I'm looking at the, the query parameter. If I have the HL query parameter, I use that locale. Other, I'm looking at the session, and I can look at the cookie, I can look at the IP. I can see if the, use, if there's the user is logged in, I can look at what the user settings are. Or I, use at the, I can use the accept headers from the browser. And of course, you can use this in any order you like. Someone pointed out to me I should switch to, to ladder. But I mean, oh. Um, you can use, you have to have a strategy, which strategy you ever like. Something I didn't expect when I was working with the new languages is that my design would be affected. My, um, I first noticed this when I translated my, my uh, site into Russian. Because if you have a nice little button saying save user, that button is not nice nor little when you translate it to Russian or in this case Finnish, because it will be way wider. And how does your, how does your menu handle if every element in the menu gets one centimeter wider? It may split up to two rows. And also if you have like a 200 pixel wide sidebar, how would that behave if everything, every item in that got way wider? I mean, if you've done your design properly, like I do not do my designs properly, but if you if you do your designs properly, then this is not an issue, but this is something to be aware of. Um, speaking about design, I made this on my site. I, I, was, I was pretty proud of this. It's a great language switch, switcher. I put it in my photo somewhere. And I showed it, my UX designer this and say, hey, look what I made. And she wasn't really happy about it. She didn't like it at all. And I'm like, what's wrong with it? I, I got the, the, uh, the language and text, and I got the flags here, and I or even got the language translated into the local language. And she said, don't use flags. Don't use flags at all. And she had one counter example is, what flag do you use for Arabic? And that's why you shouldn't use flags. Um, the language switcher, by the way, is pretty simple. This is the HTML for it. I used to use the HL, and I, my local resolvers picked this up and changed language. Speaking of Arabic, Arabic is aged. Uh, they, they read backwards, they read R to L. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you reads Arabic. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Uh, what I did here to support this, I just tried to figure out if this language is a 
R2L language, like if the local is Arabic, then insert some CSS. And this is actually, and I, you could also insert a like, uh, like a, C a reference to a CSS file here if you liked. I'm not 100% sure that this CSS is the perfect CSS, but you, I mean, you, you, get the f you get the idea. And if you recognize this code, it's actually the same code that prints out the Symfony web toolbar. I, yeah, I barely think I've renamed the variables. A uh, do you get this code, by the way? I, is this news for you? I mean, do you recognize this? Uh, this, this listen for kernel response. This is an event subscriber. You all, you all seen these kind of things before. I have a few more examples with event listeners like this. Uh, another question I've seen sometimes is how do I solve my translations in JavaScript? There, there, are, there are really th three good ways, or there are two good ways and one okay way. Uh, the best way, I think, is just to put your translations in the DOM. You just, I mean, say if you have a toggle button, you have to click and change the labels. I mean, just add your translations like this, and you can and use, use JavaScript to figure out which label to show and which label to hide. This is the m simplest way. You could also, this is the way I don't really like, you can use the William Durand JS translation bundle. I know William Durand is here at the conference, but he does not, he's not here. Great. Anyhow, you can use this bundle. It basically dumps all your uh, all translation to a JavaScript object. I don't really like this because I don't want to expose all my JavaScript or not a complete. No, I don't want to expose all my translations in JavaScript. So I, I I would like to do this myself instead. I just create a JavaScript twig file and then I just create a JavaScript object like this and I get my translations. Simple as that. So this is how how I get my translations, my PHP translations f in the JavaScript. Great, great. I'm done with my kind of lightning round now. I hope I'm giving you some tips and tricks on the easy topics, like the w topics you you do once and then forget about. Um, but how do you actually work with this? Um, let's talk about adding translation keys. This is something you probably do uh, that I do all every day and you do as well, I, I believe. And there's really no right answer to how to add your translation keys. The important thing is that they will eventually end up in uh, your cloud service. Okay? So I, here's, like a f here's a few different ways you can add them. The, the simple and boring one is to just go into local and translate yourself. But this is not a, I mean, this is good for translating, not really good for adding things. You could also extract from source. Most, most uh, Symfony translation libraries support this. I mean, like Lexis support this, Symfony components support this, PHP translation support this, and JMS translation model support this. They're equally good at it, ob obviously. Um, and also, this will never catch everything, because it's real hard to do static analysis on your code and find dynamic, translati dynamic translations. So they, they will catch most things. Uh, if you're using a great bundle, you have a little add button in their web UI. This is PHP translations, by the way. Uh, so you can add new translations in your web UI directly. Uh, what I like, though, I mean, these were the three boring ones. What I like, though, I mean, you know, in Symfony, you have this profile bar and it shows you the how many database requests this thing's doing. If you click on the translation page, you see all the translations, and you can just edit them or add new. I mean, but it, I use it when it says the two translations missing, and then I can get them up here and, like, and I can add directly in the profile bar. And they will be saved locally and also sent to your translation host. I think this is cool. This is what I use. But if you, if you feel that you're way more hipster, or way more cooler than this, there is something called like edit in place. So you can basically activate it with a button click or however you like. And you can edit your translations in your design. So you know how they will look directly. And they will also end up here in your translation so source and also uh, up in, in the translation cloud. This was Damon Alexander. He thought, hey, this is an awesome idea. So he, he, he added this. And I, I, think it's, I think it's cool, but I, I prefer my pr profile thing. So this is about five ways to add translation. How about edit? Um, if you are a good developer, you, or if you're working in a team, you're probably 
you probably branch out from master to implement your feature, right? And then you add all the translation to feature, then you merge down to master, and then you deploy it. Everything is fine. However, if, you, if you're branching out, adding a lot of new translations, changing translations, and what you do, and then before you're merging back down, you deploy master. Then you have your old code you with new translations. And this is obviously not a, not a good idea. So what I did in, in my team, I enforced this rule that we never, ever, ever change translations. Um, yeah, if, if, if you have the issue, I mean, of course you can change like typos or grammar stuff. And if you're having, um, if you really want to replace a button or replace the meaning of a button or a paragraph, you just use a new translation key. You could, if you don't like this rule, you could, um, you could store your source, your, no, your source and your English translation in Git. And then when you branch out, you add your address translations, and then when you merge back to master, then your CI process makes sure that they end up in local. But that's, it requires some DevOps and CI, and I don't really, I don't really appreciate, oh, I don't really appreciate DevOps so much. Um, also, if you add, if you decide to change translations, then you have to be aware of this. I mean, you have to be aware of if you change one language, you have to change all languages. So say this is all my translations, and I have a button on the start page that says start. If I decide to change this to read more, I need to remember to flag or mark the Swedish and Russian translation as well. It's really easy for me to understand that, hey, read more and burja is not the same word, so I have to update it. But it's impossible for me to understand that the Russian translation is wrong. So if you decide to change translations, make sure that you have a system to flag all the all translations to, to, to know what to change. This seems complicated, and that's why I enforced my simple rule to never change translations. Now we have two different ways, you pick and choose which one you like the most. Um, say that uh, one day a customer calls, and he or she says that there's a bug, and you find the bug, you fix the bug, and in your fix, you're adding a new paragraph and a button. And you added your, uh, you added them in English or Swedish or whatever, but you have like 80 other languages. How, how do you deploy this hotfix? I mean, it's really important that it's get deployed now, but how, how can you deploy it? Because you don't have it translated into your, your other six languages. So we have some options. You could wait for all the translations to, uh, translators to finish their translations and then deploy the hotfix. And if you call them and say, hey, I have two words to translate, they, it won't cost you a dollar. I mean, they will probably charge you in half an hour for that. Um, another option would be to use your fallback language, your fallback locale. So am I okay with my Russian user having a button in English for one or two weeks until my translator call up, caught up? Or I can use Google Translate. <laughs> this, this actually... I think, I think all of them are valid, to be honest. I'm actually using Google Translate because my, my, my users are, they're not that picky. And Google Translate is, I know it's awful for translating text or essays. They're, they're awful. It's the best we got, but they're awful. But for actually buttons, menu elements, and short paragraphs, heading on websites, that's actually how Google learned to translate. So Google is actually pretty decent. And again, I'm, I'm okay with my Russian users have a decent translated button for a week or two until my translator week, a monthly, monthly review, review caught up. But then again, if you're selling luxury cars in, in different languages, I mean, you shouldn't use Google Translate. It depends on your application. Um, say another customer calls, a new customer calls. That customer is from Thailand. He wants to buy your services. So now you need to translate your application into Thai. And you know that not all of your translation keys are used equally much. Some are more common than others, right? So you gotta figure out a way to prioritize your keys. You gotta figure out a way to know what features that, uh, that uses which, which translation keys. Because maybe the, the Thai customer only are interested in feature X and Y, so you don't have to translate Z and all the other features you got. So what you should do is you should do a, like a translation logger. This is also like this is another um, event subscriber. I listen on kernel terminate, which is after I sent the request, uh, the response to the to the user. So here I just 
ask the translator, like, hey, can I get what translations you were using now? And I sort them somehow, and I add some metadata, and then I send this away to a cache or another server somehow. That server, like, crunches the data and add labels to it. So I, I can figure out if I'm using this URL, I'm actually using this feature. So I can log them in, in local. I can say that this, this, um, this translation key belongs to this feature. So when the Thai customer calls and says, I want these two features, I don't have to translate all my features. Make sense? This is a way to use knowing what translations are used when and how and where. I should also mention context. I don't know if you ever translated something, but it's real hard to translate something without context, especially if you see a list of things, a list of words. It's super hard. So you should be uh, nice to translators and give them at least some context. An easy way to do this is to ha put some context in the keys. So I've, I've written down a table like this, and this is what I'm not enforcing, it feels too strong. I mean, I, I encourage all of my developers to, do, to, follow this, to follow this schema, to follow these rules. So I basically says, if you have a form label, just prefix the uh, translation key with label. I mean, if I have a help or flash or error message, just prefix them as well. If I'm writing a heading, just suffix them with he the word heading or paragraph zero one. If it starts with a, under, uh, if it starts with a uh, small character, just underscore it. This will give some context. And also, I, I know that the Symphony best practices recommend against this, but I mean, if you have like a, if you have a translation key that you can never reuse, why don't slap this long translation key on there? I mean. Point is, write down some rules for yourself and try to follow these rules. Even if it's good rules or bad rules, your translators will be more happy about it. Um, let's talk about reuse. You probably pay your translators by, by hour or by word. So it's tempting to reuse your translation keys because then you pay your translator, translators less, right? You, you save some money. This does not really work, however. It doesn't work at all. And the reason is because languages are way, way more difficult than you think they are. I mean, I, I, I know Swedish, English, and maybe some German. There's plenty of languages that I don't know. Like, for instance, in Russian, they have two forms of plural. So they have like the two ways to say apples. They have one apple, one, two, three, four, apple something, and then if more than five, they say apples. So my point is, don't reuse keys because you don't know all the languages. Another example with Russian that I've learned is if you have a heading saying user, I used one key, I cannot reuse that for a button saying user because that's a different translation in Russian because a button somehow, somehow implies an action and that's a different word in Russian. So point is, don't reuse keys because you don't know all the languages. In there's a thing called clusivity. English does not have this at all. So if me and my friend were standing here and you came up to us, I said, we won the lottery. Do I mean like we all won the lottery? Or do I mean we, not you, won the lottery? There is no way in English to tell the difference. But in like most non-European languages and in sign language, there are an inclusive we or an exclusive we. So don't reuse keys because you don't know all languages. A more obscure example is that in some uh, native Australian languages, they don't have words for direction. They don't have words for right, left, backwards, and forward. Instead, they use north, west, east, and, and south. That means that at any point of their day, they know exactly which foot is the north foot, which is the south foot. Because if they don't know this, they can't speak properly. So, don't reuse keys. Also, there's 50 words for snow, Eskimos, blah, blah, blah. It, it's a lie, but you, you get a point. Um, in, in, in Swedish, we have uh, the same, we have a word, val, and it means both whale, election, and choice. We never have a confusion with this. It's, it's, it's fine. But if I didn't know English, I would be tempted to write, like, label val and use it for all these three instances. So, don't reuse keys. Um, 
unless when you do want to reuse keys. This is have been a, like a major point of my talk. Like, I'm giving you a lot of options. Like, here what you could do, here another thing you could do. So you can decide that you ignore my advice not to, to reuse keys, and you have a hassle later when you're translating things to Chinese. Or you can define, you can say that I want to do some heavy lifting right now, so have it easier later. I mean, it's, it's, it's a balance, and I I want you to know what you you're choosing in between. I want I want you to know what you're that. If you're reusing keys, you, I want you to know that you have a lot of work later, or possibly you have a lot of work later. Um, I will talk about some tools. I mentioned that the Symfony translation component is it's a great component, but it's not enough for supporting our, our this process or these processes that I've suggested. So there are three major tools. There are two Symfony bundles and one great, great, great organization. Uh, I work with all of these. There, there's one I'm a little bit more passionate about than the others. Um, and I basically, I don't know if you remember back in 2016, I was, uh, I, me and two other guys were uh, promising to maintain the JMS translation model for six months. So we actually closed, merged, or reject, rejected like 80% of the issues there. And uh, it, we, we did very well, we did awesome. Uh, however, after after six months, I went to the owner and said, "Hey, I would like to further develop this, and I have this idea and that idea." Uh, but we didn't come to an agreement. We he didn't like it. So what I did, I created PHP translations, and it it's not a it's not tied to Symfony. It uses some Symfony components naturally, but you can e equally easily use it in a PHP application or a Laravel application. Uh, and it has some great GUIs and nice structures, SAS integration, the auto fallback, everything I mentioned here. Uh, just to be clear, I don't think the owner of JMS Translation is a bad guy for not agreeing with me. I mean, he's, he's excellent and does some major work and I have great respect for everything he contributed to the community to. So if you see him, just give him a high five or something because he's, he's a great guy. <coughs> and this is, this is weird. I've noticed this with PHP developers. PHP developers are really passionate about the number of dependencies in their Compose.json file. They would much rather like include Gussel, one dependency with 6,000 lines of code, than like five dependencies with a combined 1,000 lines of code. I think this is pretty weird. I can talk more about HTTP plug later if you like. Uh, but there's a book written by Matthias Novak. It's called Principle of Package Design. He basically says that here is solid on a class level, then it lifts this up to a package level. It's a great read even if you think you are a very experienced developer and you know solid by heart. Um, anyhow, if you don't want to use bloat down your composer JSON with um, your translation tools, there is a CLI for this. I've basically taken a, a major Symfony application, I throw in all the translation stuff I could find in there, and then I pack it down to a little far. And if you download that far, you can just use it in any PHP application, in your Symfony application, Laravel application, and you can extract your sources and blah, blah, and it, it, they will be put in the right directory and stuff like that. You can even fire up the web server and have the awesome GUI if you, if you like that. Um, that's pretty much it for this talk. Do we have any questions right off the top of your head? <coughs> 